Hello everyone. You might know this voice, it's it's me from this same YouTube channel. Um, there's no disembodied hands for you today, but believe me, I brought them with me. I've brought someone else with me today, actually, because this is something a little bit different that we're trying. Something of a uh, social experiment. Now, joining me here is a guy called Tom. Who are you, Tom? I am the videographer and editor here at Watchfinder. So um, I piece together all of your um, lovely watch hand rambles and shoot all the lovely watches that you talk about. And you've been studying me and suddenly thought it would be quite funny to bring me on to the YouTube channel and make me make a fool of myself. Ten years ago when you started with Watchfinder, Tom, how many, um, how many watches did you own? How many watches did I own 10 years ago? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, when I started, I had a uh, Timberland watch, which I got for my um, 15th birthday or something. And I, um, when I started working, I used to wear it just because I liked wearing a watch. I just always just wore a watch. Um, but I stopped wearing it quite quickly because I felt embarrassed. <laughs> 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 oh, let's fast um, forward those 10 years then to now. How many how many enthusiast watches do you own? Um, I have three. I have two Seikos and a Casio. <laughs> I should still be embarrassed, shouldn't I? <laughs> no, no, no. So these, these, these watches that Tom owns are enthusiast watches, I would say. And so you have gone from owning let's say zero watches for the, for the sake of conversation, you've gone to owning three enthusiast watches, which means I have corrupted you. Yeah. And we've got to a stage now where you know quite a bit about watches and probably more than you think you do. So I was very interested to make a, a routine conversation about watches with you to see where you are and where you're going in your watch collecting journey to see if mm. I can't ruin you even further. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to um, do this show and I wanted Tom to be on it so we could talk about watches and cover off both perspectives of people who are enthusiast buyers right at the beginning of the scale and someone who has a bit more knowledge. So we're going to delve into your mind and we're going to find out what it's like to be someone just getting started with watches. Prepare to be surprised. It's not, <laughs> not that much. I know the main things. I know Rolex Submariner, Tudor Black Bay, Grand Seiko and uh, Swiss. <laughs> and that will carry you very far with 90% <laughs> of the conversation. <laughs> okay, this is your show, Tom. So uh, what are we calling it? So yeah, um, we don't have a title for it as yet. I was thinking watch losers. Um, <laughs> I feel that might encapsulate it quite well. Um, but yeah, maybe not. So it, it, perhaps if you, dear viewer or listener, have a idea for a title for this show, um, please let us know in the comments below. And maybe one lucky person will get to name this show. What an honour. Good luck to you. Think of all the <laughs> best words and put them in the right order and you'll win. <laughs> yeah. Right. Good. Let's get into it. Let's find out what's piqued your interest in the watch world this week. Uh, so, yes, recently, I say recently because my concept of time has abandoned me. <clears throat> recently, there was the Grand Prix de Logerie de Geneva, aka the GPHG, aka Watch Oscars, a big fat watch award ceremony. Did you see it? Were you there? Uh, I, I did not. I, I think um, I'm suffering from the same time affliction as you are, because when you told me about it, my reaction was, oh, um, I, I did not know it had been on, but I've had a look at some of the non nominations and I think we'll talk about the, the winners as well. It's, it's not often, I think with all of this talk of Rolex and stuff that keeps happening, you forget how many wild and wonderful watches are really out there. So it's quite nice to see a wall of watches yeah. that have colour for a start <laughs> uh, and something a little different to a five-pointed crown logo on them. Yeah, there are some there are some wacky watches out there. Um, yes, so um, the uh, award ceremony features watches that were commercialised from May 2020 to October 2021. So yeah, there's a lot to go through. Um, there are 14 categories in total. Um, let me just list them: ladies, ladies' complication, men's, men's complication, iconic, 
tourbillon, calendar and astronomy, mechanical exception, chronograph, divers, jewellery, artistic crafts, and petit aiguille, and challenge. What about that audacity? Oh, hang on. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's um, Yeah, so there's also a special award um, that they crack out if um, there's something there that is um, worthy of it, and that's the Audacity Award. Um, crazy watches only. Um, yeah, so, um, and also on top of that, there's the uh, the, the crowning glory, the Agui Dor uh, Award, which is, uh, which Agui, Agui Dor, I think it's Golden Needle, but actually thinking about it, it's probably Golden Hand, seeing as- The Golden Fist. Yeah, golden hand. Seeing as all the awards are at the the trophies are golden hands. So yeah, let's go through some of these then. So th let's talk about the Agui door, the uh, the best in show, and that was a Bulgari Octo Finissimo. Is this? Are you familiar with this particular model? I mean, obviously it, it has to have been around a new a new thing since May. So but it looks it looks familiar. Looks like the Octo Finissimo. Well, there's been this whole thing with Bulgari. Uh, taking on Gerald Genta's legacy. Obviously, he has passed, and during his last few years, he sold uh, some of his iconic shapes to um, to Bulgari, and and one of them is this. Uh, I think he called it the Octo by Retro, and of course, it very much featured his legendary eight sided case which here you've got the rounded bezel but the case itself has those eight facets right uh, and another love of his which were retrograde complications which in fact do you do you know what a retrograde complication is tom have you absorbed that knowledge <clears throat> um retrograde complication uh it's sort of deteriorated in a vintagey style <laughs> um I'll, I'll give you partial credit. <laughs> well, that's patina. <laughs> a retrograde complication uh, is something, say, in this case, the date, that instead of having a, uh, a window with a wheel that goes all the way around and completes its circumference and starts again, it's a wheel with a break in it or a hand that only goes around a partial arc and returns back to the beginning. Um, so that adds a further complication to just the hand starting again by going all the way around and completing the circle. It's an unnecessary complication because, of course, there are many perpetual calendars that do without a retrograde complication. But it's a nice display of watchmaking finesse, if you like. And it gives you this really cool round display that can be larger than life. Whereas normally with perpetual calendars, you either have a smaller display, like you see with the day and the month, mm -hmm. um, or you'll have a window, which can often be quite small. Right. And added to that, uh, Bulgari has also made it the slimmest perpetual calendar. You've got a uh, an automatically winding watch, uh, power reserve of 60 hours, which is pretty decent as well, uh, with a full perpetual calendar with an additional complication of the retrograde date. Say what you like about Bulgari being a jewellery brand. This is a cool watch. Yeah, that's serious, isn't it? And uh, GPHG has seen fit to honour them with the uh, best in show for that. So, well done, Bulgari. <laughs> and I don't think they've tried to cheat the game here by making the case really big, you know, just thinning it out, spreading that bit of butter further over a larger piece of bread. The case is uh, 40 mil, so it's a, a fairly normal size case that accommodates all of that too. So um, extra well done, Bulgari. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. Yeah, looks good. So uh, the, other, <laughs> the other thing that caught my eye was the Iconic Award. So to be eligible to win the Iconic Award, you need to be a watch from an emblematic collection that has been exercising a lasting influence on watchmaking history and the watch market for more than 20 years. Um, so yeah, it was the Royal Oak uh, Jumbo Extra Thin that won that. Um, I think it's worth noting that um, the Iconic Watch Prize has been a category for the last three years and uh, the Royal Oak has won it twice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is obviously an icon. It's not everyone's favourite watch, but this one though has a new hat <laughs> with the in, in the shape of the green dial. Do you like um, eight sides? Do you like <laughs> screws that don't turn? Forget about it. We got them. Uh, yeah. Do you have that in green this year? <laughs> yes. 
extra thin for me. Excellent. Yeah, so, I mean, do you know what? This this demonstrates, this this is an extra thin watch, and for an automatic watch, 8.1 millimeters, that is thin. And we were just talking about 5.8 millimeters for the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Perpetual Calendar. That further emphasizes just how thin that watch is for yeah. a perpetual cal an automatic perpetual calendar, that it is substantially thinner still than the extra thin Royal yeah. Oak. Yeah, crazy. Great, yeah. Let's have another mention. Um, we spoke about it earlier, the Audacity Award. And they gave that to uh, a Louis Vuitton Tambour Carpe Diem. And it is cray cray in the cranium. Quite literally. That, that, is, a, <laughs> that is a snake and a skull on a Swiss watch. Um, I, I'm not sure. I haven't read the description, but I believe it was made for a chapter of a motorcycle gang. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but I didn't expect you to expect you to say that, but now you have said it, 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 it seems to make perfect sense. Um, yeah, I don't think that's true about the motorcycle gang. Oh, <laughs> well, I believed it. I believed it. And now I'm slightly disappointed that it's not <laughs> made for a motorcycle gang. Maybe uh, Louis Vuitton, you could retrospectively... Carpe Deum seize the day with a motorcycle gang of your choice. Yeah, um, yeah, crazy, crazy piece. Um, let's have some more of it. I'd like. I want to find out because it says it has in, in terms of its functionality. Uh, okay, so the time can be read on demand. To reveal it, simply push the reptile-shaped push piece on the right of the case. The central snake's head lifts up to reveal the hour aperture positioned on the forehead of the skull while the rattlesnake tail oscillates towards the minutes, placed below the power reserve hourglass. Oof. It, co it continues, it does more. <laughs> Go on. We're not done yet. Um, while monogram flowers appear in lieu of an eye, the skull's jaw emits a mocking laugh from which emerges the words carpe deum, seize the day. Wait, it doesn't actually make a sound, does it? Rock, 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 rock. I On the hour. Not. That'd in the middle great. of the night that would be terrifying <laughs> awesome it's my new grail that's what people say isn't it when they like a watch uh, yeah, that's well done bonus points <laughs> for you um, hooray and you can say that because we both know neither of us will ever be able to afford one of these yeah. so no one will ever hold us to it did you ever get that Louis Vuitton tambour carpe diem oh no it's on my list can't afford it <laughs> next payday next payday <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so uh, that was GPHG, Grand Prix de la Géry de Geneva, a.k.a. the Watch Oscars. Um, go and check out some of those pieces on their website. They're amazing. Maybe tell us which ones you think should have won, and perhaps if there there are some that didn't even get a nomination that you think should have been up there. be interesting to see. Mm. Good. Right, would you like some questions? Fire some questions at me, bro. Okay, here we go. Handsome Disease asks, excuse me, can we please talk about Bove watches? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the brands that I really hope to um, do more with in 2022. Um, yeah. If, if I give a little bit of context, um, of course, Watchfinder, the pre-owned watch specialist, purchases a number of different watches and they are on hand for us to review. More often than not, those are the kinds of watches that people buy... Um, more popularly. Makes sense. Mm. These sorts of watches that we'd like to see are very, very rare. They're purchased by collectors who never sell them. They stay in the collection and what a collection they have. We really want to go and visit some of those people who have those collections and visit the brands that have those watches that otherwise would never make it to us so we can uh, show them. And Bove is one of the brands that we really, really, really want to go and see. They make some incredible watches, some incredible high-end uh, production methods and, and finishes and quality complications, all of the good stuff that we want to get our macro lens in uh, nice and personal. But the difficulty is, is those watches are made in low numbers and they typically sell um, without venturing anywhere near the pre-owned market uh, and sure. they're very high value items, so they're not going to stick one in the post. Yeah, hopefully we'll get our hands on one soon. So stay tuned, handsome disease. Um, 
You may be in luck. Okay, um, Zach Busman asks, this might be a dumb question, but do watches behave differently in space? Are they more accurate? Maybe since there's no gravity to help slow down the movement. It's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. And something that obviously NASA has taken very seriously. Yeah, they've sorted out the pen that can write upside down in space. Yeah. There was, what did they do for the there watch? There was Tang. Excuse me? Astronauts drank Tang. What? You have to Google that. The astronauts drank Tang. That's that's the thing. Okay. Um, but really the crux of the question isn't as simple as it behaved differently in space because there's so many aspects of space that cause a watch to go wrong, which is, if you recall all the tests that NASA did on the Speedmaster, of which some of the other watches that uh, competed against it failed, um, there's a number of different things. There's the vibration of the rocket, there's the incredible cold of space and the incredible heat of space, so you don't have an atmosphere there to insulate and protect you. Uh, Banging it on the rocket door as you're getting in. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, but the, the, no the noise and vibration of a rocket taking off, granted that's not space particularly, but the, the journey to space is very violent. Mm. Um, so those are all sorts of things. But I think uh, what Zach is specifically talking about here is um, zero gravity being in a vacuum. And I know that's what he's thinking about because he says maybe since there's no gravity to help slow down the movement. Um I don't know. Amazing. Is the answer to that. I can speculate. One of the things that uh, it impacts a watch is gravity, why, why the tourbillon was created to try and reduce that effect. Mm. And so when a watch is placed in different positions, um, there are typically five positions a watch is tested in. Uh, dial up, dial down, crown up, down, I can't remember the others. They will have a different effect on the running of the movement because of the uh, the impact of gravity. So the fact that that gravity has an impact on a watch on Earth suggests that if gravity is no longer a problem, it will run differently in space. And my speculation would be that it would run um, much more uniformly. Right. It may be that if you set up a watch for operation on Earth to give you a good average between those different positions, that it may wander off in space. And that has to be considered when setting a watch, uh, but I imagine, given the general accuracy of a, of a mechanical watch, that a well set up watch on Earth will just perform a little bit better in space. Oh, cool. Oh, there you go. Um, and that's it for questions. Um, if you have a question, um, post it in the comments below and I will uh, trawl through and pick out the best ones to ask Andrew next time. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, We'll, we'll do this again, shall we? Yeah. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you didn't like. Um, if you didn't like it, you know, be nice. We're, we're both very, very sensitive. Yeah, you, don't, you don't see the tears that happen when we read the bad comments. We really do take them yeah. personally. I'm a real person. <laughs> so we look forward to you saying lots of lovely things in the comments. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, there's nothing left to say, but... Okie dokie, see you later. Bye bye.